Uh, yeah, so my name is Vladimir Smirnov. Uh, I work as a system administrator at uh, Booking.com, and uh, I'd like to talk uh, about uh, how we manage to scale our graphite stack uh, to actually fit our needs and uh, to <coughs> be ready for our scale. But first of all, uh, so, um, so why do you want uh, to store a lot of data, a lot of metrics? Uh, so I see there are several um, common cases. Uh, one of them is capacity planning. So when uh, it's the end of the quarter or at the end of the year, or you just want to understand uh, how fast your service is growing, uh, you might need to have a historical data for quite a long period of time uh, just to do the prognosis and to understand the trends and so on and so on. So you may order a hardware, may plan a budget for that or something like that. Uh, another big case is uh, troubleshooting and postmortems. So when something uh, goes wrong, uh, you might want to have uh, data from the, uh, the past uh, to look at how it used to work, what's actually happened now, uh, to understand uh, what went wrong and how to prevent it in future. Uh, and another big topic is uh, visualization of some sort of business data. So you want to understand how your uh, business actually feels now, like. For us, it might be something like uh, amount of bookings that's done or something like that. Uh, but this is kind of business-related data, so you still want to store that and have some historical data for that. And well, this is just uh, the cases I can think about. There are actually a lot more cases for that, but still. So, and how the graphite related to that? Uh, graphite is basically a system, uh, well, on the official website it's described as it can kick us to bubble gum and make it easy to store in graph metrics. Um, so it's a set of uh, several pieces of software uh, that allows you to store time series data, so data that comes in uh, kind of even portions over the time, uh, and time is one of the <coughs> keys when you do the, uh, so when you check and like ask the data. Uh, it have very uh, simple protocol. Uh, like to send the data, you can just do something like echo uh, name, value, date, and then send it through net, uh, over Netcat to the storage, and it will store that for you. Uh, and also, have a very simple HTTP API to uh, actually query those data. And the system is, a, is also modular. It consists of several small components, uh, which you can replace or combine in any way you want. Uh, and like as an example, uh, like if you do the query that looks like some, something like that, you will have some nice graph, which which will show you like in this example amount of metrics received for some bunch of servers. Uh, so and to uh, fill our scale and actually to understand why we needed to scale that. Uh, at this moment, we have uh, many millions unique metrics per second, and that's much closer to thousands of millions of uh, metrics per second just on ingestion. Uh, it's uh, several gigabits of traffic uh, on the backend. We have hundreds of storage servers in multiple data centers, uh, also hundreds of terabytes of data that's actually stored. Uh, we have dozens of front, front end servers just the servers that just serve the API requests from users. Uh, we receive hundreds of requests per second on the front end for individual graphs. Uh, and uh, those graphs actually uh, request thousands of metrics each second. And those metrics fetches millions of points. <clears throat> so uh, if you try to uh, make it redundant and uh, use it for monitoring, you most probably will come up with a schema that looks something like that. So you have uh, some sort of load balancer on top of uh, front end. Uh, the front end will look on the several backend servers because you, of course, want to have redundancy. At some point, you also uh, won't fit into a single server. Uh, and on ingestion uh, part, you'll have some servers and replications uh, that will send your data to some sort of relay, which will balance them across the storage servers, and you'll have some aggregator to just uh, aggregate some data and store the aggregates. Uh, but this schema have, uh, actually have some problems. First of all, the relay in this case is a single point of failure, so if relay fails, uh, like the machine goes down or whatever happens, network partitioning or whatever, uh, you lose basically everything. So you won't be able to store any uh, data anymore until you fix that. 
Another problem that backend servers uh, does not scale really well uh, because until like January this year, uh, the original uh, Graphite stack, uh, well, it's originally open source product and original stack uh, was doing all the requests uh, sequential, so one by one. If you have several backends, it will query first backend, then the second backend, then the third backend, and like the more servers you have, the slower it will be. Uh, another problem is that uh, it actually does not solve any. Um, so if you ha if one of the backend servers fails, it's up to you to resync the data and to ensure that it's consistent. Uh, it does not provide any facilities to ease your life in that case. And another problem is uh, that the front end uh, will be actually uh, slow at some point uh, again because uh, I do the sequential request uh, to the backend, but. Yeah, there are actually more than that. Um, so we decided to take uh, an approach and to basically fix the problems one by one. Uh, so when, when we faced a problem, we decided to fix it. Uh, so the first thing is we decided to get rid of the single point of failure. So after that, we actually will be able to use the graphite data for monitoring purposes. Uh, so to do that, we uh, installed uh, a daemon co called Carbon Serially as close as possible to the metrics producers. It also acts as a buffer, so if uh, um, there is some networking problems or something like that, uh, it will store some data in memory and will send it uh, when it will have some, uh, when it will be possible. Uh, also, we installed uh, several relays uh, in each data center, and uh, the local relay can do the uh, connect as a lo uh, L7 load lo balancer, so it knows about the protocol. It uh, can send it to multiple destinations uh, in parallel, and so on and so on. So this is how we decided uh, we get, got rid of the single point of failure in this case. Uh, also, um, for our cases, the original uh, relay. Uh, it was not really uh, good enough in terms of performance, um, so that's why uh, the thing we wrote, uh, we decided to write it in C, uh, and it can actually process more than one million points using only two CPU cores, so it's pretty fast. It also can replace the aggregators, it's also, uh, for our cases, was faster than uh, Carbon Aggregator, original one. Uh, yeah, so the second problem is, uh, uh, we try we tried to solve is the scalability and um, uh, scalability for backends, and also we decided to try to like if we have a problems on the backend side, the user should not uh, be able to notice them, because uh, in like we adopted Graphite in 2011 or something like that, uh, and at that point, uh, if one of the backends uh, down in one data center. Uh, you will get the first answer, even if it's not full or c c contains some gaps. So if a person hit a refresh button, uh, they can see uh, different graphs all the time because it can, it can come from the first backend and from the second one and so on and so on. Uh, so we wrote a small daemon called uh, Carbon Zipper uh, that basically can uh, heal the metric. It will try to wait until the first full response uh, also, it will query the backends in parallel and will try to uh, fix all the gaps it will be able to find. Uh, yeah, and uh, also around the same point, we uh, replaced uh, Carbon Cache, the original daemon that writes the data, with a custom uh, set of daemons uh, with Go Carbon and Carbon Server. They are also well, written in Go <laughs> and was kind of faster in our cases. And as a result, um, before replacing this daemon, uh, we were able to handle around 80 requests for individual metrics per second, and after that, it was like around 3,000 requests per second. So this, uh, w uh, by doing that, we also fixed our performance problems. And at some point, we uh, also collaborated with an open source project co called Go Carbon and uh, contributed a module to actually uh, that can serve the data from the disk, uh, also written in Go. Uh, another thing we decided to uh, fix was metric distribution because uh, like when you have a lot of uh, servers, uh, especially for some complex system, uh, you might face an issue 
uh, that actually the distribution is not even. So one server have, uh, let's say, 4,000 requests per second, another serves at, that, at the same point 6,000 requests per second. Um, when you have hundreds of servers, the difference might be even worse. And uh, like to uh, split the data across the servers, we used, originally we used the consistent hashing algorithm provided by the uh, original Python stack. Uh, but because of this uh, thing that it was not really good enough for our data, uh, we decided to look for something else to replace the, so to improve the uh, distribution. And well, actually, uh, we found out uh, that uh, around the same time, Google released a, nice, a really nice white paper about uh, jump consistent hashing. So it's basically a small function that you can uh, apply uh, to uh, the result of your hash function. And in that case, you get uh, like much better distribution, but there is a small drawback that you cannot decrease the size of the cluster. You only can add new servers to it. Um, well, be, uh, this, is, uh, this comes because the uh, consistent hashing actually guarantees that if you add more servers, it won't cause the complete redistribution of metrics. So you won't need to reshuffle all the data and like, spread it across different servers. Uh, only some small parts of it will go to a new server. Um, so, and yeah, but with jump hashing, you cannot remove the servers. It will cause the, a lot of problems with the distribution. But, Usually for us, it's not the problem. Uh, another thing we decided to solve next is the performance of the front end. Uh, so again, we took the same approach. We just uh, rewrote the stuff in Go. Uh, and that allowed us to achieve uh, results like this. So before uh, uh, switching to a Go version of front end, average, uh, average uh, response time for user was around 15 seconds. After that, uh, it became less than one second. Uh, just, uh, and it was uh, after we switched uh, the stuff only for JSON and Grafana, so it's like most of the users, not all of them, of course, uh, at that point. And it was just a rewrite, well, like one-to-one, uh, -one. so we have not uh, tried to optimize anything in the front end at that moment. It was just, j just the result of rewriting. Uh, it also allow, allowed us to uh, implement some more complex math functions because we now have much more time and like people were much happier with the response time. Uh, so they can do some more complex math, some more complex graphs. Uh, they actually started doing more filtering and uh, aggregating on the front end side, not on the back end, and so on and so on. Uh, another thing we decided to Actually, so this is, might be a little bit too obvious, but uh, I still I think worth to mention. Uh, like when you have, uh, let's imagine that you have eight servers and you want to have them like, have some redundancy. Uh, one of the usual mm, choices for that is to have a replication factor too. So each metric that comes to the backend server hashed twice and sent to two different servers. Uh, there is another way to do that. You can just pretend that you have two clusters of four servers that com have the complete copy of the data. And well, the third approach you can just, uh, for the second cluster, you can just compute the hash differently. Uh, use different hashing algorithm, for example. Uh, so we decided to create a false ex experiment to actually see how much data we will lose in case of, uh, like in worst case, so if two servers fail, uh, failed and they, can, they contain some overlapping data. And, uh, well, it's obvious that with replication factor two, we lost only 3% th of data for like two servers loss. Uh, with replication factor one, it was uh, basically 25%. Well, uh, it seems obvious. But after that, we decided to compute the probability of like, what's our chances to lose the data in worst case. And with replication factor one, it was actually 14%. And with replication factor two, you'll always lose something. So uh, because of the nature of the hash. And when you uh, cannot actually rely on the hardware, so when it fails or something like that, uh, sometimes it's actually uh, better to choose uh, to make two clusters with replication factor one than to actually go for replication factor two. Uh, uh, another uh, thing uh, 
we decided to do. So this was done as a, uh, one of internal hackathon projects at Booking uh, by the guy who is uh, also sitting here. <laughs> you can, yeah. Uh, so we decided to, um, like, when we started using uh, Graphite for monitoring purposes, we actually uh, faced a problem that without tags, uh, create a useful monitoring that won't uh, produce a lot of uh, false positives or some or like false negatives. Uh, it's actually really hard uh, because Graphite does not support uh, multi-dimensional names. Uh, so, uh, like the uh, several people in uh, at Booking decided to like collaborate, spend several days, and create uh, some system that will allow you to do the tagged queries. So. Basically, what they do, they created a separate uh, in-memory storage uh, that, is, uh, that receives data through Kafka uh, about like, tag, uh, tags and metric names, basically. And then they like, store that, create some indexes, uh, and allows you to basically uh, do some simple Graphite-compatible queries, but with tags. You have some limitations because of the Graphite syntax you uh, well, can do only and kind of queries, so it can be a data center, uh, data, uh, data center and status and role, so nothing like or or negative queries or something like that. But it's still better than nothing, and well, we hope that at some point we'll make it more feature complete. Yeah, and we actually also have a lot of plans about uh, the future. So, for example, we are looking to. Uh, find some Whisper repl uh, replacements. So Whisper is a backend. Uh, so it's uh, uh, how the database format called. Uh, it has some limitations. For example, it does not support any kind of compression. So uh, we store, uh, like every point takes approximately 12 bytes uh, to, uh, to store. We also have uh, problems with aggregators because creating a redundant aggregators is hard and that makes them not really useful for monitoring purposes because if aggregator fails, all the metrics that go through it uh, will also be lost. Uh, we're also thinking, uh, now thinking about replacing the graphite text protocol, at least between the components, uh, because like, more and more we are receiving requests like, okay, I want to send uh, this amount of data and like, I want to reprocess all my logs and compute like, several, uh, billions points and send them uh, to you. Can I do that? And like people are spending really a lot of time on serializing them to text, uh, really a lot of time, like, because it also consumes really a lot of bandwidth, uh, because well, text is too explicit, let's say. Um, uh, we also uh, will, uh, now would like to migrate to some sort of streaming protocol between the backends, because like. Nowadays, we receive, uh, people started using uh, filtering on the front-end side, not on the back-end or aggregators. And because of that, they sometimes do really crazy queries. And because of our architecture, we need to fetch uh, several copies of data. And like uh, recently, we found out that there is a uh, dashboard that uh, fetches uh, like, to, uh, like to draw several lines. It fetches something like six gigabytes of data from disks. Uh, which is kind of too much, and sometimes it causes problems to just to process those data. Uh, uh, we also, like, not so long ago, we uh, okay, I, uh, let's, let's skip the stuff. So uh, we started to um, uh, thinking about how to instrument our stack. So um, we will we'll be able to fix some problems uh, inside our uh, our stack, like a spot. Uh, the people who use our data really a lot, and we decided to uh, try to store information about like size of, the, of our metrics, or basically size of files uh, in database, and then draw them as some sort of flame graphs, so something like that. And after that, like after something happens, you can see that the graph is actually different. And well, in some cases, you can spot uh, what, what path is actually grow by some margin, and in that. In the case, you can come to the person who is responsible for that and ask them, like, okay, do you really need those data or not? Uh, yeah, and, uh, well, all the stuff we have is actually open source. It was originally developed as an open source project. Uh, we now have a bunch of them. We are trying to uh, 
uh, aggregate uh, all uh, all stuff related to our stack in a single uh, a single GitHub group uh, called Go Graphite, uh, but it's still not everything is still uh, is there. And like not so long ago, we also found out that except of us, uh, there are at least two companies uh, that have really big graphite setup based on our stack. It's eBay and Slack, uh, <laughs> which I think is also really nice. Uh, yeah, so uh, any questions? <laughs>